Those that are sticking around, I'm going to ask you if you would please open with me in your Bibles to James chapter 1. So we're going to go to the New Testament epistle of James. And as we get ready to start, as you're turning there, I do want to share with you some news that I shared with the first service, and I'll share it with you now. One of our uh, longest uh, serving church members, Miss Nita Bain, uh, she's been uh, struggling through some health issues over the last year, and I want to share with you that um, Brother Bob Cato and I were able to go over to her grandson's house and pray with her and pray with him yesterday as she uh, went to be with the Lord yesterday afternoon. And so be in prayer for the Bain family and for the Santos family as, as um, Rick and his family are dealing with their loss. And what I'm going to do is, as we did in the first service, I want you to pray with me as we pray for that family and, and pray for our service today. So would you, would you pray with me this morning? Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for, once again, this opportunity that we have to be in your house and lord as we are here gathering to worship you and and even now as this uh, as we begin the message portion of the service father this too is an act of worship as we hear from you would we know that there are many around us that are struggling there are many that are hurting uh, several have suffered the loss of a loved one we think specifically of uh, Miss Nita Bain and her family um, suffering that loss. Father, it's bittersweet for us as believers because, Father, we know Miss Nita was a believer, is a believer, that she is now perfect in Christ because she is with you. Father, in your goodness, in your grace, you ushered her into your arms yesterday uh, early evening. And, uh, Father, as we those that are left behind uh, struggle with that reality that a loved one has departed. Father, we, as your word clearly proclaims, we do not grieve as those without hope, for there is coming a day when your son will return. Father, there is coming a day when all will be made right. And until that day, Father, as we see loved ones and friends depart and, and go to be with you for eternity, while we're still here, this creates a healthy longing to one day be with them. And we know that we will. Your son is coming back. And so, Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for all that you're doing. And, Father, we ask that you just give their, their family uh, just peace that surpasses all understanding. Father, a comfort that could only come from you and that you would use us to be an encouragement. Now, Father, as we turn our attention toward your word, Father, I do pray that you would help us to see what Miss Nita saw, what James, the author of this epistle, saw, what Paul saw, what each and every one of us who are saved has seen, that, Father, your gospel, your truth changes everything. So would you bless our time spent in your word this morning, Father? Would you forgive us in the many ways that we have failed you and just allow us to turn completely and totally over to you this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, we're going to start with the letter of James. We're going to start with verse 1. Uh, now, I know what you may be thinking, verse 1, only one verse. Well, there's a reason for that. Uh, we're going to get into that uh, here this morning. And as that slide changes over to the scripture text, there it is. Uh, I'm going to draw your attention there. If you would look to the word, we are told, James wrote this, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Very simple introduction, a very simple opening to a letter. This is, in fact, a letter. Now, we begin studying this book, as you know, right after we have wrapped up our study on the mission of the church. That mission was, as you saw last week, concluded with a call to serve. The ability for us to serve God, to serve this church, to serve, his, um, to serve God's kingdom, we are enabled to serve because of words such as are found in this short letter from James. I want to share with you as we begin, this book has been a controversial one. It was controversial when it was first written. It was controversial, especially during the 16th century, the time of the Reformation. It continues to be controversial even today. 
Uh, as there are many who question the authenticity of this letter. We're going to deal with some of those reasons that they, they uh, attack the authenticity of this letter. We're going to deal with some of that as we move through this letter together, verse by verse. Uh, this book, as I said, has been uh, controversial. Uh, speaking of the Reformation era, Martin Luther once said that James is a right straw weed epistle, um, or straw wheat, excuse me, straw wheat epistle. For those of us not up to speed on Reformation era, era vernacular, it was not a compliment uh, when he said that the book of James is straw wheat. Um, now, when I say that, uh, I, I understand that what Luther was saying is that he felt that this was uh, a straw or a light or less than meaty epistle. Um, there are certain things that those coming out of Catholicism find in this book and struggle with. Uh, we're going to talk about some of that. Uh, now, oftentimes you'll hear Luther quoted from this pulpit. Uh, this is one time in particular, however, that you will not find an agreeable stance uh, on Luther's statement from this pulpit. I, I do not believe that this is a straw wheat epistle, that this is a weak or less than favorable epistle. In fact, I believe that this is a crucial letter for the church. Uh, this is a, of vital importance. And so the emphasis on works, again, was not favorable for those coming out of Catholicism. We will show through a careful study of this book that James is not preaching salvation by works, nor is he preaching a different gospel than Paul. Uh, in our Sunday school class, there's a class called Foundations. It's a systematic theology class. Early in that class, we talked about an area of theology that is called atomism where uh, there are those who would hold on to Scripture as though it were individual atoms separate from one another. Um, that sounds good. It sounds smart. Uh, it's problematic, though, when we start to take pieces of Scripture and part, part those away from other pieces of Scripture. If we look at James um, separate from the rest of Scripture, we can, in fact, come away thinking, Maybe James is teaching something different than Paul is teaching. If we look at Paul's letters and say, maybe Paul has a different theology than James has. What we're going to show through this study of the book of James is that not, not that they were, in fact, competing, but rather Paul is preaching the gospel defined while James is preaching the gospel applied. And we need to understand that very important distinction so again, the emphasis on works is a struggle. Uh, we're going to show uh, as we work through exactly what James is talking about. Now, when I talk about the controversies in Scripture, I need to take one second to just make a, a small caveat here. Uh, when we start reading Scripture, as you study throughout Scripture, and you find something in Scripture that, or in God's Word that you look through and you say, I don't particularly like that, or you find something you say, well, that doesn't sound right. I, I don't like the way that that reads. I don't like the way that that sounds. Uh, when you find something that you feel this is a major contradiction, what I would advise for you is that you must adjust your thinking. If you come to the Bible and find something that you think is wrong, you have a choice. Either God is wrong or you are. Um, I would submit to you that we must adjust our thinking when we find something contrary in Scripture. Whenever we find something that we don't like or that we feel is wrong, we must assume that it is us first that is wrong, and we need to look for more truth. We need to dig a little deeper. When we read things at face value, we can come away with competing ideas. So what we're not going to do through this study is look at things from a face value. We're going to dig deep into the Word. We're going to dig deep into what James was talking about. And as we do this, we will find that James is not competing with Paul, nor is Paul competing with James. But we will find that the two of them together give us valuable insights that we must grab a hold of if we are to mature in our faith. And I trust that you'll find that to be true as we work through this book. Now we come to this study, and as I said, James starts off by saying, James, a servant of God 
and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. What we're going to look at today is who is this James? And why does it matter who he is? One of the first responsibilities we have when we study a letter um, such as this is to determine who wrote it. Of course, we do have to define the context. We need to know what the literary context is. We need to know what kind of literature we're reading. We need to know the, the geographical or cultural um, context of those he was writing to. We need to define that context historically, theologically. We need to work through all of those to really understand and determine the purpose and the scope of the ov overall message of the letter. We will do that as we move forward. Now, for our purposes today, we're going to take a special interest in determining exactly who this author was, as I believe it makes a difference. It makes a difference. Now, when you receive a physical letter, uh, when you receive a letter in the mail, some of us still receive actual letters in the mail, and when you do, you look for who sent it, right? Right? When you see who sent it, that really helps you in determining how you're going to receive the words on that page. For instance, if an admirer sends you a letter, you're going to read it a little bit more agreeably um, because, you know, that person is fond of you. But if you're reading a letter from a constant critic of yours, you may be defensive in your reading of that letter. And it may contain the same words from those two individual sources, but depending on who that source is, it may change our view of what we find on the page. I say that because it's important to know who James is because as he starts talking about an active living faith, a faith that is shown by works, we need to understand why he's digging so deeply into that point. We need to understand who this James is and where he's come from so that we can understand the letter a little bit better. Now thankfully James identifies himself at the beginning of the of the letter. He says James a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So thankfully, we have a first name. Unfortunately, we don't have many details right there in that first sentence, that first verse. Um, but what we do have is we have the rest of the New Testament. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to track down exactly who this James is, and we're going to see four parts that help us to understand the person of James. First, we're going to see that James is a half-brother of Jesus. Now, in early church history, and pretty much ever since, there has been a widely held belief that James the Just, as he is often called, uh, the half-brother of Jesus, is in fact the author. Some people have referred to James as old camel knees, um, and that's because he was so consistent in his prayers that he developed large calluses on his knees, according to church history, and they called him camel knees. Um, I, nicknames were different back then, but, um, but they went with it. Now, what we need to understand is who is James, the brother of Jesus, and why does that matter to us? Because there are some that say, no, it wasn't James, the half-brother of Jesus, because those from a Roman Catholic background would hold that there cannot be a half-brother of Jesus because of the perpetual virginity of Mary. And so the Roman Catholic idea is that Mary continued to be a virgin after the birth of Christ. What we find in Scripture is that that is not a compatible view with Scripture, because Scripture clearly tells us that she remained a virgin until the birth of Jesus. We know that there were brothers, that there were even sisters of Jesus. So this argument of... Um, Perpetual virginity holds no water when considering what Scripture has to teach us. It's true that the half-brother of Jesus is the one who wrote this book, but to see that, we have to set the stage for how he got to the point of writing. So I'll move rather quickly through these several, next several passages uh, as we see who James was. And first, I want to take you to Mark chapter 6. Uh, you don't have to turn there. I just want you to hear these words. Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, tell us this. Jesus went away. He was up on a mountain, and he went away and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished. And they were saying, where did this man get these things? And how is this wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? 
Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. So we see that Jesus had brothers and sisters, James being one of them. Uh, Galatians 1.19, Paul tells us very clearly who James is. As he says, I, he was talking about going up to Jerusalem uh, just before this passage in, in Galatians 1.19, and he's referring to the time he spent with Cephas, or Peter, and he spent 15 days with him. And then after that, he says these words, I saw none of the other epistle, or excuse me, none of the other apostles except James, the brother of Jesus, or James, the Lord's brother. This is very important because Paul recognized there was a brother of Jesus named James, the same James that would later become an apostle, but I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. James was the half-brother of Jesus. Now, what does that mean for us? Because if you grew up with Jesus, we would think you would probably be a believer too. Again, you would think But let's look at what John has to say about James, as James was at one time an unbeliever. John 7 verse 5 tells us a little bit about Jesus and his family when we're told that now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So his brothers said to him, listen to these words, they said, leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples may also see the works that you're doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Verse 5, for not even his brothers believed in him. Not even his brothers believed in him. This is crucial because there is clearly a point when James did not believe in uh, in Jesus' claims. We see this very clearly in Mark's gospel. In Mark chapter 3, we're told that Jesus went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. It's talking about this same feast. They gathered to have a feast, and there were so many people that they couldn't even eat. And when his family heard it, what was going on, when they heard all that Jesus was doing, Mark 3, verse 21 says this, They went out to seize him. His family, his brothers, went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. So after selecting the 12 disciples, Jesus came down. He gave his disciples the power to cast out demons, and then he went to where the Jews were having a feast. Notice what was said about the family of Jesus as he came home. Normally, if you've been away for a while and you come into town, your family is excited, I would hope. Uh, If you go home, especially for those of you that have family on the mainland, when you visit, it should be a good time. Jesus had been away. He had selected his disciples. He came back. He gave them power to do his work, and his family heard about it, and they went out to grab a hold of him, to seize him, for they said he was out of his mind. His family, his own family, not believing in what Jesus was doing. Now, I want to be careful. I don't want to fault them too much, however, because we do know that Jesus did conceal his divinity prior to his earthly ministry. Once he began his earthly ministry, however, they weren't buying it. As we see, he selected the disciples, and what was their response? His family wanted to seize him. Uh, It was a family embarrassment. They wanted to remove him from the situation because it's awfully embarrassing when one of your family members claims to be God. In fact, when you hear a family member claiming that they are God, we have places to send people who make outrageous claims. Uh, There's a reason why his family wanted to do that very thing. Now, claiming to be divine, claiming to be God, clearly those are outrageous, crazy claims. That is, unless they were true. And Jesus' claims about the gospel, about himself, were in fact true. So why does this matter for us as we're looking at James today? Well, if James, the half-brother at Jesus of Jesus, at one point did not believe in Jesus and even went so far as to not only say, I don't believe you, but to say, you're crazy and I'm going to remove you, he went from that point in his life to eventually write this letter here. What we see in this book, the book of James, 
he eventually writes this letter, and notice what he says once again in chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. That word for servant is doulos in the Greek. It means slave. So he goes from not believing in Jesus to thinking Jesus is certifiably insane to now claiming to be a slave of Jesus, a servant of Jesus, a follower of Jesus. So something had to happen to change his mind. Something had to take place to move him from a position of thinking this man is crazy to following him as Lord Jesus Christ. Understanding that he believed that he is Christ and then submitting himself to Jesus' lordship as a slave, we, we need to understand it's very simple what happened. The gospel took place. The gospel changes everything. Point number three is that James encountered the gospel. As I said earlier, we see that P Paul, excuse me, Paul preaches the gospel defined while James preaches the gospel applied. So in order to understand how the gospel is to be applied, we need to first understand what is the gospel defined. So for that, I'll take you very quickly to Romans 1 and 1 Corinthians 15. Paul tells us in both places, but in Romans 1, he says, verse 16 and 17, some of you may know this by heart, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So whatever this gospel is, Paul says it is the power of God for salvation. This gospel, this gospel that James understood, this gospel that Paul understood, this, boss, this gospel that hopefully you and I together understand is powerful. How powerful? It is the power of God for salvation. So what exactly, again, is this gospel? In 1 Corinthians 15, this is a longer passage, but I encourage you to listen to these words. Paul tells us, he says, Now I would remind you, brothers of the gospel, I preach to you which I received in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture. So we're getting into the meat of the gospel here. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. Paul says at the time that he wrote this letter to the Corinthians. Then he says, though some have fallen asleep. Verse 7, he says, Then he appeared to James. Then he appeared to James. Then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Paul continues, but the, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and you believed. So what we have here is Paul identifying the gospel, which is the good news that we have is that Jesus came to this earth, he lived a perfect and sinless life, he died for our sins according to the scriptures. So where do we get the perfect and sinless? It was according to the scriptures that he would be sinless. He died in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried in accordance with the scriptures. As we sung this morning, he did not stay in that grave. As we'll remember in just a few weeks as we come up on the Easter season, we will remember that we do not serve a dead Savior, but in fact a risen Savior. Paul understood that and said, according to the scriptures, he rose again on the third day. And that if we trust in this, we can be saved, Paul tells us elsewhere. So we have this gospel, and I need to share with you, this gospel changes everything. As Paul said, the gospel is 
uh, again, that Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and rose again, and that James was confronted with the reality of that gospel. Everything hinges on the resurrection. If the resurrection didn't happen, then everything else was in vain. If Jesus didn't come back to life, then everything he said about tearing down the, the temple and rebuilding it in three days and that laying down his life and picking it up again would all have been crazy talk from a crazy man. But instead, Jesus himself did exactly what he said he was going to do, and his brother James saw that personally. As, J as Jesus came back, he presented himself, he revealed himself to the disciples, he revealed himself to over 500 other brothers at one time, and then to James. When James was, in, was encountering the gospel, when James was confronted with the gospel, something significant changed in his life. When he realized that Jesus is who he truly said that he is, everything in James' life changed. The gospel changed everything for James, everything for Paul, and I trust everything for you and for I. For countless others throughout history, the gospel has in fact changed everything. And I hope that you're here today and can say with confidence that the gospel has changed everything for you as well. Recognizing that Jesus is who he said he was and he really did raise from the dead and he is alive today. So what happened to this James? He encountered the gospel. He was confronted with a risen Jesus his brother that he knew had been put to death, and now he's confronted with the very true reality that his brother is, in fact, alive, and that changed everything. In fact, James went on to become an apostle. In Acts chapter 12, when he was rescued from the jailers, Peter rushed to make sure that what had happened had been told to James and then all the brothers. He was rescued from prison. He was doomed. His, his death was all but certain. And he was rescued from that prison cell. Uh, he was, as you know, in Acts chapter 12, he was sleeping between the two guards. There's no way for him to escape. And yet, he escapes. And what does he do? He rushes right to tell, make sure that James knows what happened. Why? James is an important figure at this point. James is the leader of what we would call the Christian hub in Jerusalem. He's the head of the church in Jerusalem. Peter knew that James was now important. Something had changed in James' life. He was at one time, as the disciples came down with Jesus and they saw that exchange, a younger James reaching out to seize his half-brother because he believes he's crazy, to now the leader of the church that Peter is reporting to. In Acts chapter 15, we see the Jerusalem council where Paul and Barnabas are contending that there is no need for Gentile believers to be circumcised in order to be saved. And there's this discussion about what do we do with these Gentile believers? Because Jewish believers are circumcised believers. Those coming in from Gentile faith, they're coming in as Gentiles, not having the law on their side. So what do we do with these guys? After hearing the arguments, James spoke up. In Acts chapter 15, we're told that James spoke up and offered his thoughts by saying, Brothers, listen to me. And then he alluded to Isaiah, and he quoted from Amos. And he said, when he finished his statement, he said, Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. The impressive thing here is that after saying this, all of the elders and the apostles and all of the men there at the council agreed with James. James is not just a family member of Jesus. He's a very well-respected apostle in the community. And when he spoke up, they followed. They listened to what James had to say. My friends, something significant happened in the life of James to get him from the point that he thinks his brother's crazy to now he is a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. From there, they not only agreed with James, but the Jerusalem church followed what James had to say, and being in agreement, they sent a letter of encouragement along with men to support Paul and Barnabas in their missions. And again, I say all of this simply to say that this is the same James who did not believe Jesus was who he said he was early in his earthly ministry. He ended up being a witness to the resurrection, becoming a believer, an apostle, and as I just said, a, re a well-respected leader of 
of the central Christian hub that is the Church of Jerusalem. As I've said, and I'll say it again, the gospel truly changes everything. I want to make one more point as we look forward to continuing this study in James, and I want to reread that first verse again. Having a better understanding of who James is and a little bit about his life that we found from the New Testament, look at that description again. James, we know him as the half-brother of Jesus. We know him as a follower of Jesus, an apostle. We understand who James is now, but look at what he says. James, a servant of God, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the half-brother of Jesus himself. That's some serious claim to fame, right? His brother, his half-brother is the savior of the world. I don't know about you, but if I was James, I'm writing that in giant letters. My big brother is Jesus, so listen up. That's not what he did. It was more important to James that you understand he's a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. More important that you understand that he is a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's more important to him than that you know that he's the brother of Jesus. He's the half-brother of Jesus. He writes to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Next week we'll get into that and, and identify what he's talking about here. But again, given all that we know about James, given all that we know about James, that description that he gives us is awfully telling, isn't it? When we see who James views himself to be. James wrote this. He wrote his description. He could have written anything that God inspired him to write. And what did he write here? That he is a servant of God. His chosen title is not that of little brother to Jesus. His chosen title is servant, slave to Jesus. Being the earthly brother of Jesus isn't the biggest thing on James's radar. Again, in fact, it was most important to James that he be known as a slave of God. Now, Judas, uh, what we read in Jude, his brother, uh, wrote uh, a letter as well. And in that letter, he starts off by saying, Jude, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, James's brother, didn't identify himself as Jesus' brother either. Why? His brother's an apostle, but he's a servant of the Most High King. He's a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's my hope and prayer that we have the joy of discovering this letter and its truth verse by verse, that we'll find the greatest claim to fame that each and every one of us have is not who our family members are. It's not what we've done on this earth, but it's who we serve. That is our greatest claim to fame in this life. Now, I share that, of course, knowing that we're going to get into a book that very clearly talks about having an active faith. We're going to go verse by verse through very difficult and hard passages, passages that require us to get out of our seats and get to work. So there will be a lot for us to discuss. But what I can share with you this morning is that if you, like James, have not, if you, unlike James, have not come into contact with the risen Savior, if you have not um, been forced to deal with the resurrection of Jesus and the gospel has not changed you, we need to start there. James started there and his life was never the same. I'm excited about this study. I, I truly cannot wait to see all that God is going to teach us through this, but I need to share with you, we need to be certain about where we stand with Jesus before we can really begin talking about what it means to serve Jesus. This book will require us to change our lives. It will require us to get in line with what the gospel teaches, and that is that faith in Christ requires action. Not action for salvation, but action because of salvation. We're going to discover that. Uh, what I'm going to do now is in just a second, I'm going to pray, uh, and then I'm going to ask you to stand after we pray. That's a time of response. I, I mention that because right now, as we get ready to pray, I want you to take a moment to really reflect on where you stand with Christ. Have you come into a right relationship with Him? There may, you may be sitting here today and saying, no, I've known about Jesus uh, for a while, James knew all about Jesus. He was his kid brother. He grew up with him. But it wasn't until he was confronted with the reality of the resurrection. So I ask you today, what have you done 
with the reality of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's true, He is alive. He's ascended on high to be with the Father. There is coming a day when He will return to gather us and bring us all home with Him. And until that day, we have a responsibility to serve Him well. Before we can serve Him, we need to understand where we stand with Him. Has the gospel truly changed everything for you? Father, Lord, we come to you as we begin this study, understanding that James has a very interesting story. Understanding that James has a backstory, a history. Sometimes we say we can't do anything for you because we have a backstory, we have a history. Maybe we've gone too far. Maybe, we, maybe we've done things we're not proud of. But Father, none of us accused Jesus of being crazy and tried to seize him in front of the crowds he was trying to reach. But James did. And yet you still used him. And not only did you use him, you used him in a mighty way, Father, as he not only served well, eventually was martyred for his faith, but Father, he wrote this letter to give us an understanding of an active faith. And Father, the way that you used him gives us proof. It doesn't matter what our backstory is. It only matters what we've done with your gospel. And so, Father, for each and every person that's here this morning, I pray that you would confront us with the reality of your gospel. Confront us with the truth of your son's resurrection. Father, that none of us would leave this place this morning without first coming to terms with the fact that there is a Savior. His name is Jesus, and we serve him here at Mililani. Father, I pray that you would help us to examine our hearts over these next few moments we spend together, that as we continue to worship you, that you would be pleased and that you would let your gospel change everything for us. Father, would you use us for your glory and your honor alone? For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.